What is going on? Welcome back to Jiu Jitsu Outlet. I'm sitting down with the top ranked athlete from the continent of Australia, Mr. Josh Saunders. What is up, man? Thanks so much for coming on the show. How you doing? Doing great, man. So I want to get into the concept of accelerated learning and hearing about how you were able to go and become an ADCC trials champion in just a couple of years. You actually got your brown belt in just a couple of years, man. Usually that takes people so long. So I'm really excited to dive into that. But first, I'm going to ask you the question that I ask everyone to start off the interview with, which is how has training in jujitsu and the martial arts helped your mental health since you started training? I think in, um, in, in a way, what it, what it does is allow you to realize the triviality of everything else that you do with your day-to-day. And essentially that, you know, there's, there's a lot of people who live their day-to-day lives where they come to a cafe like where I'm at now and they'll get almond milk instead of oat milk and they'll lose their shit and they'll freak out and people cut them off in traffic and they get really angry and all those other bits and pieces. And you kind of realize the triviality of that when you're continuously getting your blood taken away from your brain or your elbows turned inside out. That makes a little bit of a difference to everyday life. You don't worry as much. You don't stress as much. You kind of acclimatize to what dealing with stress actually means. And then that frees up your mental capacity to be able to dedicate that to other areas. So you start to focus a little bit more on what matters and focus a little bit less on what doesn't. And uh, it's obviously beneficial in that regard. Yeah, it helps you put things into perspective. Like you said, you're not getting pissed off by random stuff that happens. Exactly. Exactly. It makes a big difference. Yeah. And I feel like it kind of connects you with this almost like primal history that we used to have. It reminds you that that there's a lot more to life than your, your oat milk latte. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, there should be. You yeah. hope so. Okay. Hopefully. I mean, oat milk lattes are pretty dope. I'm not going to lie. I, I actually really oh, like those. Oh. I might actually be that person who freaks out if I got an almond milk latte instead of an oat milk latte because I would know 100%. I would know. But you're right. It's at, the, yeah, at the end of the day, it's it's meaningless, right? Like this whole this whole thing. Essentially, right? It's like what, what meaning do you ascribe to such trivialities? And I, I think the majority of people wake up in their day and they, they choose to do things and then they'll belittle themselves about those choices. And it's like, well, you chose to do it. You're the one driving the bus. Why would you then shame yourself for doing the thing that you didn't want to do and then put guilt on top of that and start to associate all your behaviors with the incorrect decisions or however you want to, however you want to put it? And I think jiu-jitsu does a good way of representing what uh, corrective action could be like because if you make too many wrong decisions, you just get submitted. Yeah, exactly, man. That's a, that's a great way to put it. Like You have to almost turn your brain into a supercomputer. Well, your brain is a supercomputer. You have to unlock it. You know, yeah, well, you just have to express it as such, right? Mm, that's a that's a good way to put it. So, I wanted to ask you this, man: How have you noticed training in martial arts help other areas of your life, like business, or maybe your relationships with other people, or anything like that? It's a good question. Business and relationships, in terms of that, it's it's very systemized uh, as the, as the learning process with jiu jitsu actually is. I think if you are going into a, a session of any martial art really and you don't have a game plan you don't have structure thank you you don't have a vivid vision of what you would like to achieve out of that session you only really get a couple of hours a week for most people and if you're willing to put that on the table and waste it without a dedicated plan or some sort of foundational structure of which you can follow mentally as as a blueprint as we go over you're probably leaving those hours on the table so i think if that is the case in one area you got the Miyamoto Masashi once you know the way broadly you know it uh, once you know the way deeply you know it in all things you just cross apply that lesson to everything else in your life and you go oh actually if I have a system for how many dates I take the wife on or if I have a system for how many um, outreaches I do for specific clients or uh, the, the way that I try and articulate the business plan from my head to their head because it's all about communication at the end of the day and then if you have a system around those things well Obviously, you get better outcomes because you've got two doors to choose from, either yes or no. Did it work? Did it not work? Okay, it didn't work. What's my contingency plan? Okay, if that would, if that didn't work, how do I do that again? And actually, it's, it starts to align itself a lot with business owners. Actually, I've found, I don't know if you find that at your school, but a lot of, a lot of the students at my school are, are business owners, which is really cool. So you get a bunch of like-minded people and they start to espouse the same lessons that I've been learning is that it, 
systems win, essentially. If you're going to rock up to jiu-jitsu training with no plan, well, then you're going to get treated like you have no plan. And it's the same with business, the same with relationships, the same with any other facet of area of life, same with health. You rock up to the gym or the weightlifting gym with no plan, you're going to work out in a roundabout manner. You're probably not going to enjoy it. You're not going to derive a great sense of passion from it. And in two to three weeks' time, the motivation is going to dip and you're going to stop coming. What's the point in that? That doesn't make any sense. Yeah, you're not going to get the result that you want if you don't have a system. And the best yeah. entrepreneurs I've ever met, they've systematized success. Like one of the greatest mentors I've ever had was a guy named Alex Sharfin. He's a really high-level business coach. And he would talk all the time about how he breaks down every success that he has. Like any single time that there's a success in the business, um, he would, you know, have a meeting with the team and break down exactly what happened. We would do like a after action review, kind of like in the military or something like yeah. that, where after and that happens in the military, too. I was in the army for six years after every single operation. There's a they call it an AAR or after action review where you go over what went well and what didn't go so well. And you work to create a system around that. So I feel like that's that's kind of what you're saying is like, that's kind of how jujitsu trains you to think. It's like you have to have that system, whether it's a Kimura system or a cold outreach system. The system is what is super important. Yeah, essentially, right? Because you don't land in arm bars or heel hooks on accident. There was always a, a chain link of movements that orientated you in a position where you zigged where you should have zagged and then you felt some tension in your arm and maybe a burning funny sensation. And you're like, oh, I shouldn't have done that. And if you look at it like that, Again, to circle back to your original question, how jiu-jitsu helps your mental health aspect, it takes the emotionality out of it. It's it's very logical. It's very understandable. It's very systemized. You don't get frustrated trying to pass Butterfly Half anymore because you recognize that, well, I, I just didn't do the things that I was here to do in the system ordered that I was meant to do them. And then it takes out all of the... Uh, like the self-worth kind of aspect out of it. Like a lot of people attribute this. I've had a lot of experience in sales. A lot of people attribute their self-worth, whether the person picks up the phone or whether they get a cold lead and turn them into a hot lead or whether they get them into a business consult or sec send them to the next, the next stage or anything like that. And the people who kind of clips that, it eats away at them because if you've ever done cold calls, or you've ever done jujitsu, you realize it's going to be a tough slog at the very beginning. Eventually, you get better at it because the more you do it, the better you get. The better you get, the more you enjoy it. The more you enjoy it, the better you get. So you're going to continue to do it long term enough to get good at it. But uh, most people never sort of get over that little hump, probably about the four to six week mark. Yeah, for sure. What do you think that is? Like, what do you think is one of those things that kind of prevents people from progressing in their journey and moving it, moving forward and staying motivated? That's another That's another great question. You're good at this, Paul. I, I'm enjoying I try this. That. I try, bro. Um, I've been podcasting I mean, for a minute. <laughs> I, don't, I don't care what they tell me about you, Paul. I think you're a good dude. <laughs> them. I know who they are. Don't worry. I'll, I'll get them, bro. I'll get them. Yeah, so I, th I think, I think honestly, it's a foundational thing. Um, I, I haven't lived in the US, obviously, so I don't know what the scholastic system is like, but I would assume that it's very similar to one in Australia. And there's this permutation of adverse to failing having adversity to failing and, and thinking that it's a bad thing or it makes you look a certain type of way or it should be avoided because it's going to hurt. The best moments in your life are where you come back from those moments. So if the best moments in your life are where you come back from those moments and you never seek those moments out, then how are you going to experience the biggest highs if you don't experience the biggest lows? There has to be balance and order to, to the chaos. And if you want to have high highs, you're going to have to have some pretty deep lows. I remember back in uh, November of last year, I'd just come back from ADCC. I'd just come back from getting a brown belt in two years. I'm fucking flying high. I had a good match with Felipe Pena. I got scored on, but I didn't get submitted. And all these all these things were going on. All these things going crazy. I'm, my social media's gone up a little bit. And I, I come back to a grappling industries, uh, just a no-name tournament in the, in the back ass of Sydney and I ended up running through the first two guys easy as 12 second submissions, both of them. And then I faced a uh, eventual brown belt world champion who's a black belt under Andre Gaval at uh, Artos. He lives in Australia. His name's Nicholas. And uh, he's, he's good, man. He's very good. And I had a match with him and I, I looked over him. I looked completely past him. I said, no worries. I got this guy running high. Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm doing all the things I need to do. I just went to ADCC. I'm fucking king shit, right? And uh, if Felipe Pena didn't put me away, this guy cannot put me away. I, I didn't get submitted. I didn't get scored on, but I ended up losing a decision that I probably shouldn't have lost. And I was 
furious, furious, not because he beat me, but because I allowed myself to change my perspective enough that I could allow that to happen. And I, I'd come back from that, and I was like, fuck. I, I, for not, not for one second did I think, oh, you look like an asshole, you look like a cocky piece of shit, blah, 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 blah. It was like back to work, back to the drawing board straight away. And, and since that, since that, in almost a year ago, I've been undefeated, have have almost submitted all of the top black belts within Australia. Um, I'm going to win ADCC trials in the next two weeks in Singapore again for the second time in two years and uh, everything's coming back up. So if I had avoided that, if I had avoided that event, I wouldn't be experiencing the, the momentum that I'm on now where the drive and the passion and the fire has been stoked appropriately. And then first of all, you probably wouldn't even be competing because you'd be terrified of losing. So to put it into context, like there's no way that you should avoid failure. It's, it's going to happen. It's a necessary part of the journey, but it's actually the best part because it shows you more of who you are. How do you react to a loss? It, everybody can everybody can kill it when they're winning. Everybody can work hard when it's sunny and beautiful outside, but only, only the special type of people can work hard when it's raining outside and it's gloomy and it's disgusting and you've, you've got to get going. And it's similar to uh, Jocko Willink. Whenever, whenever things are going bad, he just says, good, right on, keep going. Yeah, it's very well said, man. And um, I think that there's a lot of beauty in losing sometimes, even though it sucks. I hate losing. And uh, it's probably my least favorite thing, to be honest with you, losing at anything. But it, there's a lot of beauty in the failure sometimes because there's so much that you learn. There's so many things that happen in that kind of after action review that you always put yourself through after every single match or if you lose a tournament or something like that you learn so much but that's really kind of what separates the men from the boys is the people who come back from that and the the others versus the others who just kind of drop off like there's a lot of people who can't handle failure um, especially if they've never done anything like this before and maybe they've had a really easy life and then they get into jujitsu or martial arts and this is like the first really hard thing that they've ever had to do and they go out yeah. and get sma- they go out and get smashed at their first tournament or something like that or they're just getting smashed in the training room but you really yeah. start to see like there's kind of those two types of people there's the person who shows up and says like this is a part of the process this is what i need to do and i'm just going to suck until i get better and then the other person just quits and the one person will go on to achieve you know their goals the other person will not and um Man, I feel like jujitsu, kind of like we've been saying, it trains you for that, not just for the mats, but for all of life and business and your relationships, teaches you to not be a quitter, even if you lose. Yeah, yeah. And it's funny, right, as well, because most people, if you ask them at a, at a young age, would say that I want to avoid all the failures and all the downturns and all the things. I just want to have a ton of success. And you see those people, especially within American sports like the NBA and the NFL because they're very heavily documented on the the college route and all the way before they actually turn professional. And you look at those guys that are extremely blessed with talent, and they may have been coasting or they've they you know they they run a like a four two forty, and they don't really train that hard for it. They're just freaks, athletic freaks. They're the guys that barely ever make it to like this goat status you got the, the story of tom brady he's the most unathletic guy on planet earth couldn't even he's got two left feet and two right hands he couldn't he couldn't even do star jumps he's that unathletic but he allowed that to catalyze him into the best one of the best players to ever put on boots in the nfl and i don't think without that adversity and without that failure and without getting drafted what was he drafted 190 something i don't think with, without that, he would have become as good. I think the depths of your lows actually capitulate into the heights of your highs. I think if people want to take anything away from this episode, it's just absolutely do not avoid any of those lows because they make you who you are on the upturn, on the backside of things. It, to the degree of which you've been trifled with or you've had a, a shit deck of hands or you, you've drawn a bad hand or anything like that, it's like, well, okay, good. That's going to be one hell of a story. That's going to be an awesome story when you right. do turn it around, do make something out of it, when you do start to charge forwards. Think think about the story like the movies, TVs, books, everything uh, in a sense of like mental fortitude. It's always the superhero figures out that they have some innate power, but they have no idea how to use it. And then they come up against a force that is too difficult to conquer, and then they have to go back and, and find something inside themselves. Then they come back at the end of the movie or the book or the story or whatever it is. And then they finally beat the overcoming adversity that they had no chance to beat in the in the first half of the of the story. 
that's life. That's the oldest story on earth for a reason. It's the hero's journey. Like if you can apply that, it doesn't matter where you are, doesn't matter who you are, doesn't matter what color you are, what sport you do, what what business venture you're in, you start to realize like, hey, I can do that. If yeah. if that's the oldest story in time, why don't I just take my turn to to appreciate that and then appreciate where I'm at and realize that it's on a journey and I'm going to come up. Yes. And you said it. I honestly, I feel like I could, we could do a whole episode talking just about that concept, especially about the hero's journey. Cause really it's something I'm, I'm actually secretly obsessed with the hero's journey. And, um, it's really the, it's the quest for self realization, self fulfillment uh-huh. at the end of the day. Like that's the allegory that it represents is self, uh, self realization. Absolutely. And- it's, it's the individuation process. It's self actualization. It's Maslow's hierarchy of needs. It's it's all of these all of these core philosophies and core principles. It's uh, Nietzsche's becoming Ubermensch. Right. All of these philosophies, and I think the more that you dive deep into this mental realm and this uh, perspective building understanding, is that you realize they're all saying the same shit. They've just said it a little bit differently. Right. And you allow them to contextualize your understanding and your perspective to recognize that you're kind of uh, placing clay more and more clay onto the sculpture every time you read into these different uh, ideas and philosophies and that different bits and pieces may click for you the way that someone says it versus the way that the other person says it. So it's this continual, it's this continual cycle of learning and building and learning and building and adding to the formation of the structure. And that, that's kind of like the psyche of who we are. So yeah. you never stop learning, you never stop getting better. And then you cross apply that not only to mental faculties, but also to physical actions. Like everybody has the capabilities to get better in jiu-jitsu every single day. I don't care who you are. If if you can, if you have two legs and two arms and a head, and you come into jiu-jitsu, I can make you better every single day. It just right. takes a little bit of perspective, a little bit of planning, a little bit of structure, and you're good to go. It doesn't mean that this person is special and this person is not special because they're not getting better. It just means they haven't seen what they need to get better. That's it. Everybody has the innate ability to be able to do it. Yeah, that's one of my favorite things about martial arts is that if I teach you the martial arts, I'm not giving you anything. I'm just helping you unlock something that you already have, but I'm not like taking from outside. It's already all within you. You already can do the perfect, you know, reverse De La Hiva to enter the dragon or kiss the dragon or whatever the hell it's called. You know, Mm -hmm. you can do all those fancy, crazy moves. They're, They're in your body. You just have to learn. You just have to drill it, practice. Yeah. That's right. And I, I like that I like that philosophy of unlocking. Because depending on how you look at it and, and depending on how many rabbit holes you go down, how much Alex Jones you listen to, essentially we are that, right? We are innate capabilities. We we are unlimited, untapped potential. And it's this veil over the top that tells us that we're not whether it be by media or parents or so, uh, like uh, our environment or social cues that we get from other people that bring us down or whatever, whatever. We don't have to go too deep into the woods on that, but that's our natural waking state. And as soon as you start to right. harmonize with you, go, well, okay, well, successful people don't have something that I do not. They lack something that I have. They mm. lack the off. They, they lack this poor conception of self. They, they lack this idea that they're not innately capable. They lack this idea that they can't char- charge forward any obstacle. Because really, any obstacle just takes time and a bit of structure. Yeah. That's it. It, it, it. Instead of instead of internalizing it and saying, I, I am bad, I am a failure, I am a this, I am a that, it's not yet. Yeah. Not yet. That's all yeah. it is. Like you keep getting armbarred, this same blue belt in class keeps tearing you up, keeps armbarring you, and then you realize that he rolls with a purple belt, and the purple belt hits a beautiful turnout escape every single time. Okay, yeah. what, what separates you from the purple belt? Nothing. Absolutely nothing. Yeah. He's just done away with the idea that he can't do it, and then he's put some systems and some time in place, and now he's good to go. But he doesn't internalize it as self-doubt. He didn't, he didn't also quit at the front of the journey to say that, oh, it must be a me thing. He's just better than me. No, fuck that right. guy, first of all. Yeah. Second of all, put some effort into learning. Dude, very well said. I feel like, again, I could, um, could go on so many tangents based off what you just said. But unfortunately, we got to wrap this up here in about 10 minutes. So I wanted to ask you about one more thing, man, and uh, just to kind of touch on something that you brushed over earlier, which is that you got your brown belt in two years, and then you went and competed at ADCC, which is the world championships, right? And 
for a lot of people like me, I've been training for 13 years and I'm a brown belt. So like we've been training, I've been training way longer than you, but I just went and lost at the ADCC trials, the East Coast trials. So I'm still trying to achieve a goal that took you only two years to do, which is freaking um, it's mind blowing, right? So, and a lot to a lot of people, man, the stuff that you're doing is mind blowing. I know that you've got a lot of people following you on social media who are super interested in this. Can you share with us some of these freaking secrets? Like how can someone like me or how can someone, um, I feel like you have a lot of great content already about like how a white belt can get better. And, um, I'm going to link down to your YouTube channel. So if you're a white belt and, uh, and you're interested in that, like go check some of that stuff out. But Josh, what about someone who's been training, someone who's maybe already two or three years in? What advice do you have for that kind of a person to accelerate their learning? I'll give you the exact game plan, and it's going to suck because it's literally not followable. <laughs> you need to pick your parents better. You need to play high-level rugby for 17 years. You need to lift weights for 12 years, and then you need to study the mind for 12 years. And you need to do that all at once before you start jiu-jitsu. <laughs> <laughs> I, I'm sure the rugby background aided you a little bit in your quest yeah, oh, for ADCC. Absolutely. I'm okay. With that. Uh, I'm okay with that. that. That's fine. I always joke about, uh, I always joke about doing like a IBJJF competition, double golding and then melting a piss test just for fun. And then being like a fake, fake brown belt. Cause I'm not in the, uh, I'm not in like the category for years attained or whatever. Um, but to, to circle back to your question that there, there really isn't a secret. It's, I, I, I think it's the, it's, it's the positive application of what the human mind can actually do. I, I came into the sport very green. I had never done a martial art before. I'd never done any combat sports before. I'd done rugby league, which is, I know you guys consider that a combat sport and martial art over in the States because you guys think we're crazy with no helmets and pads and everything like that. It's it's pretty nuts. And I, I came into that with a, with a pretty well-rounded perspective of what it takes to make a great athlete. And I knew m- most of the core fundamentals. And then I also was fortunate enough to be introduced to, uh, I don't know if you've ever heard of Kit Dale. He lives in the States now. He's a guy from LA. He is famous for getting his black belt in, in four years and kind of speed running the game of jiu-jitsu. So that was kind of the first influence that I had in the sport. And I, I said to my coach at the time, I said, hey, this guy did that. I'm going to do that. And he goes, yeah, like if you, if you believe that you can do it and you want to have a good crack at it and you, you put in all the effort, why not? So I didn't have like a, a, a barrier to entry there where I had adversity, where if, say if I was training at Gracie Baja, they would be like, no, you have to pay your fees for 10 years, blah, 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 blah. You have to fulfill these requirements and tick these boxes. So I was very fortunate in that aspect where I didn't have like a barrier placed in front of me. And then secondarily, I, I moved on to a new coach and he pretty much told me the same thing. He goes, man, what, what you're doing is pretty crazy as a white belt. Like I've never seen this before. Uh, you, you're telling up our best competition blue belts on your first day. And I've never even heard of you. He goes, what the fuck is this? Where have you come from? And I said, I played rugby for 17 years. I did this and this and this. He goes, man, if you train with us for 12 months, you will win trials. So it was just that vote of confidence from an authority in the sport who'd been training for as many years as you had at the time. I think he's been training for about 16, 17, 18 years now. And uh, he basically gave me that confirmation that it, it was doable. And I, I think really that uh, uh, everybody tries to place as many barriers in front of them as possible. And it's kind of like this weird reverse psychology. People will, people will tell you the reasons they can't do something and then fight you for their limitations. They will say that, oh, well, I can't do this because I'm this. I can't do this because I'm this. I can't do this because I grew up in this town. I am this weight. There's this guy in my division. Look, at the end of the day, the next time I go to ADCC Worlds, the, the best of all time is in my division. I could not care fucking less. He's the best of all time now, but that doesn't mean anything to me. Time is just a, it, it, time is just a construct. I'm already a world champion inside my own head. I'm just waiting for time to catch up. I'm waiting for that to actualize in, the, in a 3D realm. So I think to answer your question that the secret is, is that all of it is mental it's the way that you apply yourself. It's the way that you remove these non-physical barriers before you even attempt to do what you need to do. Like I'm sure in, in your trials run, you, you would have had, uh, you're in 77 kilo. Yeah. I'm yeah. Sure correct. You would have had that. 
guys in your bracket, you're like, fuck, this guy is a bad dude. Like, Nicky Ryan, this guy's good. And you're thinking like a game plan of, of where you match up with those sorts of people. And the majority of people go, well, he's the best at this and he's the best at this. And it's like, well, no, what you what are you the best at? What are you the best at in your own perspective? And how are you right. going to uh, formulate an idea to accentuate that? And how much are you focused on yourself rather than focused on your opponent? How much are you focused on your ability to maintain focus within any given scenario? And then how do you apply that in your training? The, 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 best, the best lesson that I got pretty early in training is that you, you are to put yourself in the worst situation possible inside training so that if you do experience it in competition when the lights are on and there's people around and there's people watching and there's a referee and there's all these other elements that you're not used to, you, you've been there. You're familiar with that. You have contextualized yourself within the, the reality of the texture of how that feels. And you don't even have to do this in a sense of physically. You can do it mentally. You can continue to yeah. charge forwards mentally. You, you pose this question to yourself. If I am in a fully locked rear naked with a body trying on, there's three seconds to go. How am I going to get out of this? Right. How do I fight through the ice dragon? And, and what am I going to do in that situation? I'm going, am, I going to, am I going to be a man or am I going to fold? Am I going to take the easy route or am I going to take the, the hard route? And then th- this is kind of the thing of like, I, I always had this idea in my, in my head, I'll, I'll wrap it up quickly because the, the kids are arriving. I always had this idea that I was going to perform greatness in the sport of rugby league and I used to kick goals and pretend that there was a big crowd around me and that you could hear the ah. And unfortunately, because of injuries and other bits and pieces we won't go into, I, I ended up retiring from the sport at 21. And everybody was like, oh, you you know, that's that's a failure and all these sorts of things. I was like, nah, just not the right thing. And then right. I found Jiu-Jitsu two years later. I went to ADCC last year and there was 12,000 people sold out Thomas Mac Vegas cheering for my match with Felipe Pena in the first round. So it's the wild, whole man. concept, of, man, it was, un- it was unbelievable. The, the whole concept of not yet, not yet, if you have you have a big dream, you have a big a, a big vision that you want to carry and you know that it's true and you get tingle sensations when you think about it and you know that it's going to be there. Like when you win East Coast Trials, I'm sure inside your own head you get butterflies, you get tingles, you get this nervous energy, this excitement, this palpable sort of force. Harness that every single day. Vis- envisage that every single day. Replay it in your head every single day because the more you do it, the more you become magnetically attracted to the idea that it can materialize here. That's the most important part. The, the, the more you feel it, the more you see it inside your own head, not with your 3D eyes, the more you see it inside here, the more it becomes real because you become magnetically drawn towards it. Every, everybody on earth before they've achieved something great has seen it before everybody else. Yeah, and uh, Arthur, Arthur Schopenhauer has a really good quote. He goes, talent is hitting a target no one else can hit. Genius is hitting a target no one else can see. Hmm. Man, that's no one else. No one else could see two-year brown belt ADCC med, uh, ADCC trials winner in two years. No one could see that. I could. Yeah, dude, that's powerful. I could go on and on about everything that you just said, especially because you brought up the word magnetism, which is one of my favorite words. But, dude, uh, I gotta run. We gotta teach some kids how to choke people and how to throw them on the ground. So, um, Josh, can you tell us where to find you if people want to learn more about this? Where should they go? Uh, yeah. Uh, first of all, episode two is, is definitely, I've enjoyed this stuff. Uh, but you can find me at HPU Coaching on all platforms. So TikTok, uh, Instagram, uh, YouTube, and that's Dude. Well, I'll put all the links to connect with you down below. So if you're watching this and you want to go learn how to level up your game and accelerate your learning, go click those links and then click the next button that says subscribe or follow or whatever that is. But dude, thank you so much for coming on the show. I appreciate it, man. Much appreciated. Thanks, Paul. Have a good day. You too, brother.